Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Real Estate Investing Lessons from Past Recessions, featuring Passive Investing Mastery. Today, we do have to read a brief disclosure. The Entrust Group does not provide any investment advice, nor does it endorse any products. All information and materials are for the educational purposes only. All parties are encouraged to consult with their attorneys, accountants, and financial advisors before entering into any type of investment. Today's agenda for the webinar, uh, we've introduced the interest group and our guest host, Patrick. We're gonna speak about what happened in 2008 to 2010, speak about building a recession resilient portfolio, discuss recession factors to always consider, and how to invest today during today's recession. And at the end, we will have a question and answer period. My name is Tony Uncle. I am a business development manager here at the Entrust Group. I have been with Entrust a little over five years now, and we take pride in educating investors and professionals on tax preferred retirement accounts. Uh, the Entrust Group is a self directed IRA administrator and record keeper. We have a little over $4 billion in assets under administration. Over 45,000 investors have been empowered in business 40 plus years. And we do provide the one single point of contact business model. So based on your region, you will have one single contact at Entrust that will be able to assist you with all your investing needs. Uh, we are, as I mentioned, self-directed IRA administrators, administrators. We have knowledgeable staff, many with CIP designations. We offer nationwide offices to serve the needs of the nation. We do also offer in-person events and virtual webinars, provide a national continuing education program for other credentials, and we do hold a biannual IRA Academy where you can train and study to earn your CISP designation. What is a self-directed IRA? Self-directed IRA is a retirement account in which the individual investor is in charge of making all investment decisions. Self-directed IRAs provide greater opportunity for asset diversification outside of your traditional stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. All securities and investments are held in a retirement account administered by a regulated custodian or trustee. Now we'll turn it over to the folks uh, when they're gonna take you through passive investing mastery. Patrick, the floor is yours. All right. Well, I appreciate you having me here. I'm looking forward to this. Um, it's a great group to be partnered with, and you guys are all in really great hands. Um, and I'm honored to be invited. So I have been through a little bit myself um, in terms of recessions. And so this is a bit of a uh, near and topic near and dear close to my heart. Um, so we'll talk about the upside of the downturns and recessions. Here, um, I'm the CEO and founder of Invest on Main Street, as well as Passive Investing Mastery. My background a little bit, I was an automation and robotics engineer. So like many of you, I spent my, my life climbing the corporate ladder initially as a snot-nosed engineer uh, being, doing machine design. And there's a picture of me actually sitting on, a, on the manufacturing floor for a custom machine design firm. That little built that little machine to my to the left there is a flu test machine, which got converted to a COVID uh, diagnostics test machine. And the top of the graphic over on the left, there's a Tesla Model uh, S rotor assembly, rotating part of the motor, a bunch of robots putting copper bars and and magnetic steel together. And then behind my head, there's a Lockheed satellite solar cell assembly machine. So we were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. It was a lot of fun, very challenging. Um, one of a kind custom machine design and robotics. And the founder of the first company I worked for said that his only regret was not investing more sooner into real estate. And I was surprised by that because I was, I was all in in high tech, right? And so I realized I needed to, I read the purple book from Robert Kiyosaki around that time and I realized I needed to invest. And so I I went head first and I was very aggressive and I looked for the most highest returning deal I could find. And that ended up being a pre-development. And that's the picture. <laughs> that still makes me squirm a little bit. 
um, of the pre-development that took me down in 2009 and 10. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the lessons that I learned uh, and many of us learned. I mean, it was a really crazy time and then how we built a portfolio coming out of that. But fast forwarding, so in 2008 and 9, I was kind of that, that uh, looking to get the highest return. So I had been doing research uh, for what kinds of investments in real estate could produce uh, very quick wealth, like get rich quick and, you know, double and triple my money in every year to two years and pre-development, you know, you're, you're buying land, you're, you're entitling it, you're, you're, you're making it developable and then develop on it. And that big spread and, and hopefully a short period of time could really make that happen. And I, I had partnered with individuals uh, who had, had been through this before. And I was pretty sure that I had the right way to go about it. Unfortunately, I was naive. I didn't know what I was doing. And I purchased it all in the land in my own name. And I did that so I could use my own credit uh, and my own liquidity to get the best bank terms, which meant I got high leverage. I was like 90% loan to value. <laughs> so um, didn't, and there was no cash flow coming from this thing. And I was hoping that on the other side of uh, moving through the pre-development and the construction phase that I would have something to rent and then I would have something or something to sell before the market crashed. And I didn't even, it was back in 2007, the market was never gonna go down, right? Everything was on the up and up. Uh, also, I was, uh, aside from being personally guaranteed on recourse debt, I was all in in one investment. I was very aggressive and went big. Uh, and it went south and it drug me over the coals pretty bad. Uh, the property as the 2009 and 10 happened, the, the land uh, crashed, all the builders went bankrupt. And because I was in a recourse state and I'd signed on the loans and in the property in my own name, the bank sold my loan and sold my loan to somebody who finally decided they wanted to come after me. And then I had to, uh, the fully recourse meant all of my other assets became cross collateralized, which meant they could come after everything I'd built to that point outside of this investment. So a lot of lessons learned there and we can talk through and how to, how to build out of that. I uh, scaled, I kind of came crawling out and, and uh, got a master's in engineering and business started succeeding very well uh, in automation and robotics. Um, kind of bounced around to some companies, climbed the corporate ladder, and then had money to invest again. I looked for recession resilient markets, ways that uh, I, places that I could invest that were fairly stable in recessions, buying for cash flow, which we'll talk about here in a couple minutes. Uh, and then when I did single family, I did that long enough until I met my wife. And then I realized, well, I can't really run a professional career and try and also be an investor that's successful because I'm moonlighting it. I'm using all my free time for my family, friends, and hobbies and not pursuing this lady who I want to marry. And so she was there for my last single family closing. And then after that, we decided to trade up to larger multi and founded Invest on Main Street, private equity firm. Uh, now I write for Forbes. I'm a best-selling author. I've been on uh, over 50 podcasts and I speak on stages through the country talking about investments in, alternative, in the alternative space. And what we want to do is provide individuals like yourself, you know, busy professionals, another way. Another way to invest outside of what is typically the, the employer-sponsored 401k and IRA where you can self-direct it by the pals here on this uh, that are hosting in this webinar. They give you that opportunity by taking what is normally in the stock market and then putting it into alternative investments by self-directing. And if you look at why, why would we want to provide these kinds of opportunities? Your employer is not going to tell you about them and your employer's custodian is not going to tell you about them because they don't make a return if you move it into an account and self-direct it. But the middle class only has about 7.9% of their wealth in what are called alternative investments. The upper income has is a quarter of their wealth. The ultra rich have 50. So in order to invest like the high income and the, and the wealthy, you need to be able to self-direct. You need to be able to move into these alternative investments. 
Another way to look at this is with the Tiger 21 member allocation, which if you're not familiar, this is a elite subset of, of ultra wealthy in the United States. And you can see 27% in real estate and 26% in private equity. And that provides the traditional model of the stock market, and index funds and commodities uh, being half. And so we developed a strategy by which uh, we started building a recession resilient portfolio. And we'll talk about on the subsequent slides how we did that. And currently today we have about over 20, I think 26 or so properties, um, over half a billion on, that we've acquired with partners and over 4,000 units, almost five in seven states, recession resilient, tax advantage, landlord friendly, and founded in a way, and structured in a way that will provide that uh, ability to write out recessions. And what does that look like, right? And this is about learning from the past, right? This is me crawling out of 08, being humbled, wanting to be the tortoise, not the hare. This is me succeeding in engineering and trying to be the DIY investor and do it all myself and doing single family and getting burnt out and realizing that this is not returning uh, and it's a big trade-off away from other things that I want because I'm using all my time. So how do we build a recession resilient portfolio, but trade up to larger assets and partner? And that's where I approached existing construction because I don't like to hope. I don't like to hope that one day I'm gonna buy a property and then hopefully as on the other side of it, I'll have something that cash flows. Because right now what we're seeing is that's the challenge is construction costs are going up, things are getting delayed and that hope is not panning out oftentimes. So to build something that can write out past recessions that what we've seen in past recessions, it's gotta be cash flowing. Gotta buy something that exists and it's there. The cash flowing on day one or will within a couple months. And that's the foundation. Now you're not gonna get the dramatic appreciation, but this is about a risk adjusted return. Low leverage, which means in each of the markets that you're in, you wanna look for what are the recession resilient markets. What do the occupancies drop to in those markets in past recession? You can do a look back and that, that data is available. And you can say, look, I've gotta put what percent down in order to have the excess of cash flow to still pay my bills, even in that past recession. And you've gotta get the right kind of debt, right? Because sometimes debt products are variable. Sometimes the interest is fixed and that debt's variable. Sometimes the challenge is, is that it's a, a variable interest rate and that can go up. And that's happened a lot. It's creating a lot of problems right now. Some individuals at a variable interest rate got a cap, but their cap, which prevented the cost of their interest rate increasing, some of them bought that cap low enough to still be able to pay their bills because they analyzed their property and said, let's stress test it. Let's put enough down and make sure we can still pay our bills. Even if the worst happens, if vacancies drop, delinquencies grow and our interest rate goes up, right? How much should we have to put down to be able to cash flow in that kind of environment? Um, some people didn't buy a cap and they're in a lot of trouble right now and all of their income is being consumed. So building recession resilient portfolio to be able to ride out over the last decade, uh, ride out these recessions. And not only buy existing construction, but don't buy and hope values go up, but buy things that we know are underperforming to the nearby comparables that we know we can improve and increase those rents and create value work to go to and create that value. Have operating reserves. One of the challenges I had when I got into my first deal was I didn't have a ton of money in the bank that I had spent a lot. And so I was paying out of pocket to just float this property in hopes that one day it would come back or in hopes that one day, and I, I didn't have enough to be able to get to the other side. So I couldn't pay my bills. I had to stop paying. Bank took the property. Uh, Operating reserves, we keep six to eight months worth of operating reserves just in an account. What does that mean? It lowers your return, but your capital is preserved because if you have insurance, which is the next item, a tornado, a flood, a fire could hit. We're going to show you some properties where that's happened. And unfortunately, you're covered. But if you get away, if you're flooded, you have to float the capital until the insurance pays up. And a lot of the distressed operators that we're finding deals from today are people that didn't have one or more of these. 
Uh, and so by enough having enough reserves, we can uh, survive a short-term economic or a short-term natural disaster by having the operating reserves and insurance costs. And so what's very interesting is that sometimes while, uh, when, a, when a building burns down, it can destroy an operator. They didn't have the, the operating reserves to live it out or they didn't have replacement cost insurance. If they had the operating reserves to roll it out, to, to, to ride it out, they had replacement rents and they had replacement costs, then they're actually ahead. Why? Because they have a new building on the property. And what we found is that when we rebuild those buildings, we're able to build them to our new renovation level and get even higher rent premiums than we originally expected. So the building, so the overall win, the natural disaster was a win for the investors. So if it's done correctly, these kinds of things can either be what are the source of our deals or incorrectly could be the source of our deals or correctly can ride out recessions. This is an example of an asset that we purchased that we had a, a, one of the owners fell ill. This was an off market deal we were told about. We pounced quickly as Canopy Creek in Florida. Um, this property had over 300 or 280 units and not a single one of them were renovated. They had just sat on it for 10 years and basically let the place fall apart. It was a beautiful building with great bones, just outdated interiors. And one of the partners was about to pass. We moved very quickly. We used actually a family office to, to put up all the capital to close. We backfilled it with a syndication, a typical raise, many from retirement accounts like yourselves. And because we were able to move in, buy it right, move quickly and buy from a distressed owner and buy something that we could add value to, we were able to renovate very fast and capture that value. 10 months later, we sold it. We bought it for 27 million, sold it for 37 million. We did a 1031 exchange in the subsequent deal. Uh, this property right here is kind of, it's one of those ones that still makes me cringe a little bit. I, I was sitting right here in Waikiki when I got the call um, and that there's a distressed operator that has a building and he's got delinquencies. 19% of his residents weren't paying. That's called bad debt. And he wasn't able to pay his bills. He had, he had been delinquent and he needed out. And it was strange because this is near the med center, the largest life science destination on the planet in Houston. Didn't make any sense. So I red eyed it out from here, landed in Houston, <laughs> met up with my partners and we walked the units and it was brutal. They had completely neglected. He had taken his, his, uh, his issues with income out on his residence. And there were pest issues, there were mold issues, there were foundation issues. Uh, when we did the lease audits, we found, we actually printed out a stack of paper uh, that, as thick as a ream of unanswered maintenance requests. And what happens when you do that? Uh, the residents stop paying. Um, and there were so many down units at that point that spiraled. He got more of the wrong residents. The reviews were bad, which draw in more of the wrong residents and he uh, spiraled down. So this kind of, um, he didn't have the reserves. He didn't have the right business plan. He didn't buy right. Uh, and he didn't take care of the residents. And so we were able to jump in there and save the day. Uh, this one uh, in Atlanta, it's a great property. Had a building burned down. The guy didn't have insurance for it. That rippled his NOI, which made him distressed. He didn't have the cash flow to float the property. Right now, there's a blank pad where the building's just been scraped off. So we were able to pick this up at an incredible discount. And uh, this guy didn't have the reserves, the NOI, or the ability to renovate at that point. So we were able to pick it up at an incredible discount. We're rebuilding the building. We raised the capital for that. And we're going to renovate the units. Uh, this is another asset where we saw a giant flood in one of the apartments. Uh, the guy was just running raised within. He didn't have operating reserves. He didn't have the proper insurance policies, and we were able to jump in and purchase this as well. So by building a recession-resilient portfolio ourselves, it also teaches you uh, how to find the right kind of opportunities by those that aren't using those principles. So that kind of maps out what, what I, my lessons were in 2008-9, how I pivoted from kind of the DIY single family to scaling to larger uh, private equity, and then how we tooled the private equity acquisitions and the, 
to be able to ride out recessions up until, call it, this, uh, this new time, challenges of today. And each time you say, well, you're building something that's recession resilient, uh, it's like saying you have a waterproof watch, right? Uh, you take that watch deep enough and it's going to crack. Uh, and that's the case with any financial model. So we can only look back in, in the past when we build these underwriting, when we stress test, when we put our forecasting together, we can only really look back to say, okay, how do we need to fortify these deals forward? Well, here we are today. And in 2008, there's different, there was different things happening than today. And what are those different things? And what are the challenges moving forward to today? And so I want to talk a little bit about that. And I want to talk about how we can, once we talk about the challenges for today, how deals can be structured today. And so what's happening right now is interest rates are going up. That means valuations are going down. That's tough for a value-add investor because they rely on their rent growth and their improvements outpacing uh, growing appreciation. But if the tide's lowering, then you're fighting a battle. And that's what's happening across the nation right now. Inflation is increasing. I have a whole article in Forbes on inflation. I think of Patrick Grimes' Forbes inflation on how income generating real estate is the best inflation hedge. And while the fundamentals of that are true, it does increase rents. Uh, again, <laughs> while that is helping, there's a number of things that are drawing that down right now. Uh, inflation also increased maintenance costs. It also increased our renovation expenses, not just the materials, but also labor and dramatically so. Labor is much more scarce and it's harder to find the right kind of skilled labor. So those costs are going up. That means the amount that we had set aside to renovate the units is going up. Our income was further hit. We got kind of we have the ability to right, rising inflation, increasing rents, right? We have greater cost of labor, greater cost of materials, insurance premiums. In many of the Southeastern states, the kind of the core foundational states have seen many more natural disasters in recent years. I have a property that was hit by two 500 year floods in the last couple of years. They're rezoning a lot of those areas. Full insurance carriers are leaving some of those areas and we've seen insurance grow 10 to 30% in a lot of those regions. So here we are trying to uh, create value when insurance goes up. Well, that hits our bottom line in a very negative way. Property taxes, even in places like Texas where we fight it every year, they're becoming more aggressive and uh, they're, help, they're pushing property taxes up. And typically that hasn't been the case in the past. We've been able to keep it fairly under control. Um, and with interest rate growth, not just does it affect valuations, right? But interest rates growth, as we were talking about, if you, didn't, if you didn't get fixed interest, which most of our portfolio is fixed interest, some of them are variable, but we buy interest rate caps. And for many of those people that, that didn't buy caps low enough, which means they paid a lot, they raised more capital up front, well, that means they've eaten more of their income to, as the interest rate climbed to meet that cap. And to add insult to injury, the government was artificially propping up the United States during COVID. People weren't going to work. A lot of people weren't paying, uh, weren't getting paid. A lot of people weren't paying rents. And for many, for years, people got used to that, got used to not paying rents. And so what happened? The rental assistance checked in when ended one day. There was a couple other programs and we were getting $100,000 checks from the government. You think about it, like rents at $800, $1,000, it's a lot of people not paying rents. It's insane. The, the payments ended and the rents didn't resume across the country. I mean, it, is, it has been a big challenge coming out of COVID, which skyrocketed delinquencies. You know, this is that, this is that residents not paying their rents, which caused a lot of, all at the same time, a court system which had an eviction ban which was already flooded by a bunch of evictions leading up to it, it caused a flood of additional evictions as we found out who were gonna resume payments and who wasn't. And it was tough, why? Because in places like in Texas where we can usually evict in two to four weeks, that became months. In places like where one month or two months in, in Georgia, 
that became months. I mean, we're talking like four to six months now, and we're starting to slowly get this back under control. But you aggregate all of these things of today's factors together, along with interest rates rising and the inflationary costs, that makes it a really tough time for the value-add investor. And that's why you are seeing a lot, you're probably hearing about distressed deals, capital calls, and those kinds of things. And the timelines are growing. The timelines are growing is because renovation costs and construction costs are just taking longer. Materials just takes a while to get. There's a bunch of backlogs and evictions. That means we can't get people out. If they're sitting there not paying for you know, four months, that means, and we have to do the eviction, that means we, it takes initial four months to just of not collecting rent to get them out of the unit. That means we can't in, get in there to renovate. That means we can't get in there to increase value. So we're doing things like cash for keys in some areas, right? And keep in mind that we had reserves, we have tons of cash flow, so we're making it. But, and we're strong, we're strong operator, right? Man, it is a tough time, no doubt about it. So, um, and which is delaying the rent increases. Now, now that means we should all like hide, right? <laughs> Run away and hide and duck and cover. Not at all. And it's because every single year you can watch the news and they're going to tell you about something going on. But, you know, Warren Buffett talked about time, timing of wealthy investors. They, they wait until people are fearful. They wait until there's opportunity. And for the last decade, we were relying on finding these deals where we could slowly make improvements with renovations over a couple of years. But in 2009 and 10, billionaires were created by people who acted and people who bought during that time. So be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. No Warren Buffett. Today's deals is about leaning into the recession and investing in a different way. And so while building a portfolio to ride out recessions and how we knew recessions to behave from past is allow us to ride these out, but doing deals now today, what's that different lens that we need to look through to make sure that we can do that? And as you look back at 2009 and 10, and I have many friends that made it huge, I was struggling and <laughs> they were raking me over the coals for investing in the wrong things at the wrong times. But in 2009 and 10, I know people that became billionaires <laughs> because they made their money on the buy. They made their money on the buy, not the sell. They took the opportunity to buy when they struck when the iron was hot, essentially. And that's that's the right strategy, whether it's real estate, business, or stock markets. So I'd make an argument that winning with the recession today means that for the last 10 years, we really didn't have this kind of opportunity. This kind of opportunity, which we're seeing a lot of not distressed assets that require a heavy lift, but there's a lot more of distressed operators, ones that were were strong, they thought, but they didn't foresee the aggregate number of things that could happen to tax them. Things are taking much longer. The timing ran out on their debt clock. Their interest rates are too high for them to continue. Their evictions are too high and they're not sophisticated enough to turn over the resident demographic. Their, their construction costs and renovation costs are higher than they forecasted. So they can't get increased rents to make up for things like higher insurance and higher taxes. There is a large wave right now of what we're seeing is really solid assets owned by distressed operators. So making a return on the buy, not value add, or sure there's value add. There's always some kind of value to be added, but it's the reliance on that. When you can't rely on rent growth, that's not consumed by greater costs, you can't rely on appreciation through innovations. So you gotta rely on the buy just like we saw people do in 2009 and 10. Now for that, right now, we believe the strategy is direct to motivated sellers. Uh, brokers have, right? There's this big disconnect right now between where property values are and, and where owners wanna sell. <laughs> and uh, then the brokers are trying to appease the owners. And so they'll go out to the market and there's all these other operators who haven't figured out yet that these aren't good buys anymore. They're just doing the status quo. 
the deals look the same as they did one, two, three, four years ago. So they're outbidding these, paying way too much for these properties that are on market, that are out there to 20 or 30 people. And a lot of those aren't closing because the banks are saying, no, you overpaid. This is, we can't lend enough for you on this. And so I, right now, I believe the best opportunity, I and mean, we do have a good lot of broker op, uh, relationships, but the best opportunity we find is direct to owner. And you see some of the examples of some of the stuff we've done, but uh, finding motivated sellers, finding distressed operators, not distressed assets. This isn't the time necessarily to pick up the rundown clunker and try and make it better. This is the time when there's a bunch of shiny shoes on the ground, but people are like, I can't afford the shiny shoe anymore. Do you want it at a discount, right? Do you want, and that's, that's the type of stuff that I think that we can find. We are finding, and we actually have some, it's the right kind of strategy for today. And while we will put layers of maybe some value add, that's not required to meet our projections, right? That, that would be the cherry on the cake. And you, as always, you need to buy for cash flow. That's very tough to do because with the greater cost structure and the greater interest rate, it has consumed a lot of the cash flow in a lot of these deals. That is still a requirement. You cannot like make the mistake like I did. No, I don't care what price you bought it at. It still needs the cash flow because if there's a downturn, it needs to be able to ride out that downturn. So we still have to keep those fundamentals, uh, those fundamentals there. We picked up an asset that needed a couple lease ups, but we already had brokers in place that could help us lease those up. And so they need to be stabilized or they need to be stabilized quickly. And within a couple months is what we're targeting. So our strategy is not long-term holds right now. Our strategy is not long-term value add where we're trying to outpace the receding market or the, the tide lowering. We're not trying to outpace that by improving value. We're going to buy it at a good price and then we're going to move on. Maybe do minimal light value add. We're going to move on quickly to the next asset and buy it at a good price and then move on to the next asset. And by doing that, we can you know, buy assets, you can pull out capital, then buy two. And then, and then you can trade this one forward using an exchange. And then you can, you know, and then you'll have three. And then you can then do the same with this one. You have four and then eight and then 16. And that compounding ability with shorter term holds, I believe is the right strategy in this market because there is a higher flow of good buys that each time you make a step by buying right, you make a large leap in equity in yield holding it as a diminishing return right now. Because the longer you hold it, interest rates go up, valuations shift, you struggle to value add, your return goes down. So by trading forward quickly in these assets and taking advantage of the deal flow, which who knows how long this will last. All of these recessions, the United States has come out stronger. It won't be too much longer before we'll say, oh, the government came out with these different loan products and they've figured out a way. And then all of a sudden we're back to square one again. The challenge right now is consume as much of that deal flow as we can of solid properties uh, that, we can, that we know when we're going in, we can get our capital out quickly and repurpose quickly. And so that's why we're putting things into a fund now for that reason, because we can very quickly pounce. It's a little bit like whack-a-mole. We can very quickly trade for a tax advantage and refi out, trade forward, and they continue to compound. And within the cash flow play, by doing a aggregating compounding uh, structure, you may get a small cash flow. Cash flows aren't big today. Right? You know, one deal, you're not going to get that much cash flow. But if you buy that deal and you trade it into two deals and then four and then eight, that is how you can get strong cash flow. It's the tortoise, not the hare, but by doing this strategy and taking advantage of the deal flow and the replicating, you can start getting more and more properties with, with very little cash flow that then compounds to a larger cash flow check coming in. And with one capital raise, you can continue to aggregate and buy more. It helps to mitigate risk, right? Because so you build diversification geographically. We're actually in different asset classes. You're not worried so much about long-term ownership. You're more worried about buying it and moving on. So just like always, it's very difficult to find uh, deals and has been for 10 years now. Uh, it's a little easier because there's intelligent software and AI tools that help us to pinpoint 
of cross uh, target markets, uh, where to find deals. But even then you go from like a thousand leads to you fan out and we have teams of people chasing them and then they come out like 200 prospects and then we're negotiating and maybe one or two fall out. So it's the similar kind of slog that we were doing before with just a lot of challenge and struggle to find deals, but a very different approach, very different criteria, different filters pointing at different kinds of, uh, of, of operators, different kinds of investments. And, uh, but then just like before, we find the winners. And I think it's, it's, it's just a different approach to the same kind of challenge as in the past. Um, let's see. So, I mean, here's an example of a, of a property. This is a direct to owner acquisition. The seller's spouse recently passed away and leaving them, leaving them to manage the entire portfolio of 100 single family properties and a 72 unit complex. This is a exi typical example. Um, we had a son, for example, in another asset that was a software developer in, in San Francisco. He was left assets out in uh, the Midwest and he didn't know what to do with them. Those are the kinds of people who want to get rid of it. Commercial's not popular right now. He had neglected it. Similar kind of strategy. Seller was just simply overwhelmed and needed out. This kind, and it, and it wasn't occupied. This is, makes it really easy for us uh, to buy. I mean, not only did we get, I don't know if we have the actual results of this one. So we don't have it actually. So this one actually appraised for, uh, I think it was almost like 2X what we bought it on the day of closing. So when we got it, appraised for 2X, we bought on the day of closing. In addition to that, we get to do the lease up. So this one was just an incredible make your return on the buy. Uh, this was a broker pocket listing, seller ran out of funds for another project. So they became distressed because they had another project that didn't go well. Wasn't this one at all. It wasn't this one, it was another project that was distracting them keeping them away from this that was tanking them financially and they needed to liquidate this to keep their other portfolio alive. This is a great buy, 60% occupied. Um, another apartment can be 132 unit in, in uh, uh, Louisiana. Seller was getting old, wanted to retire without the hassle of managing the property or dealing with lengthy closing times. So they wanted a quick somebody to move quick and do cash, 50% occupied. Everything was in great shape. They just completely ignored it. Very light to no renovations needed. It's an amazing buy. It's a great building. Performing just needed some attention. Somebody who just wants out, we can move quickly and acquire it. And here's a retail center. Like what's a retail center? Well, in this kind of environment uh, where we're not looking to hold something for a long time, Looking to get in there, pull out what we know to be the, um, the, the equity that we know we can get from it just before we even close on it, and then do a trade forward so we can buy another one and then buy another one and then multiply these. The retail centers are a really good space right now for that because there's a bunch of retail centers that uh, people are just tired of it. They, they struggled through COVID. They're worn down and they want out. These are still performing. These are still profitable retail centers. The owner was busy with his career. He's a doctor, leaving his inexperienced wife to help manage the property. The property was in good shape in a nice town with good traffic volumes. Since the management of the property wasn't great, they decided to focus on, on their, their core investments in gas stations. And uh, we actually, it was funny because on this one, the, uh, the wife, uh, she was, she, there was a couple, couple of the units that, um, were vacant. And she goes, she goes, ah, I can tell when somebody walks in, whether or not I'm going to rent to them. I don't like anybody the brokers bought. She was just very, uh, very frisky and didn't really care so much about, about the income generatability to the property. This was just a big annoyance for them. And they just simply wanted out um, and just able to move on it quickly and be the source of relief to them. Uh, so that gets to the finish. And that kind of explains the the difference between the traditional approach of, of, or kind of the beginning of the high risk, speculative, high returning deals, resetting to smaller manageable single family that consumed my life as a professional 
and then trading that up to more larger, sophisticated, diversified syndications into growth markets that are recession resilient, and how we did the financial foundation, the projections, and found the right properties to ride out a recession. But then fast forward to this recession, how things have changed and why we're not doing the strategy of yesterday today. It's a great strategy, but today there's different opportunities uh, to respond to today's challenges. And as the tide recedes, there's opportunities for us to ride those waves in of opportunities that, that pick up. And that's a little salute to the uh, surfers behind me here at Waikiki Beach. <laughs> so um, I'm not great at surfing, but I'm learning. So it's my, my attempt to make a surfing joke. So that, that concludes, I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. And we do have right there is a 2D barcode. Um, on that, we have the opportunity for you to subscribe. So you learn about our investments. We do have uh, a, a fund that meet, meets our strategies. We have some other funds coming up on the debt side as well, all recession focused on taking advantage of the downturn. I'm also giving away a free copy of my uh, Amazon bestseller. I did a chapter in, um, it was a really fun book. It's called Persistence, Pivots, and Game Changers. I tell my whole story of the ups and downs and ebbs and flows in the high tech world and losing it all and coming back and then trading all my time to try and do it myself. And then, and then finally trading up and then becoming free enough to be able to move to places like Hawaii and travel around and, and I get to spend a lot more time with my family. I've got, tell my whole story in that. I mean, pick it up. I mean, we sent, I, 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 give, I give it away. I sign them, we ship them for free. I, it does help to inspire a lot of people that set up calls with me. They're like, hey, I, I enjoyed it. It's not just my chapter, my story is in there. The lead guitarist at Def Leppard, um, NFL, NBA players. I've got a handful of people who are just so awesome to work with, actual rock stars so to work with. And I'm happy to send a signed hard copy of that and talk. And even if you're not an accredited investor, which we work with accredited investors, 100,000 minimums. Happy to talk with you. I uh, try and get you pointed in the right direction. I do know some other people could potentially help you out, but uh, just so you know, our investments are for accredited investors and that, that'll probably come up eventually. And check us out, investonmainstreet.com. We have a lot of content. Like I said, I got a bunch of articles on Forbes and webinars and I talk on stages. Uh, we're building out Passive Investing Mastery for alternative investments, entirely different products that are out there non-correlated to the stock market. Again, helping to fulfill that 25 to 50% of the alternative space that should be in everybody's portfolio to invest like the high income earners. And just give me a call, happy to chat with you. It's part of what I'm passionate about doing. And scan the barcode. Thank you very much, Patrick. Very enlightening. Uh, it is now open for our Q and A section. Uh, Patrick will leave his contact information on the screen. Uh, since we cannot provide any type of investment, tax, or legal advice, certain questions we, we may not be, answer, be able to answer live. Um, if we come across one of those questions, I'll just uh, I'll message you in the chat and ask you to read out, reach out to Patrick directly. Uh, please find his contact information right there on the screen. Um, Patrick, outside of previous goodwill and reputation, how does your firm become a prize of direct buys from sellers? Well, so traditionally, it's all been through uh, reputation and it's all been through word of mouth. This specific time, we are approaching it very differently, like I said, with a separate kind of database that we have that looks in specific regions and we look at different kinds of data associated with the type of loans and the timing. And then we use an out, we use overseas help to help target and identify search out the owners directly. So there is a, a pretty big mousetrap there. It's very expensive to run. I think we're paying like 200 grand a year just to run that deal finding mousetrap, not including the acquisitions negotiation side. So, uh, and, and that's been very successful. I mean, there's been four acquisitions outside of the fund uh, that we have to prove the acquisition engine, the scalability and the ability to make the returns in the timeline. And, and that's why now we're, putting everything in a fund so we could pounce quick and trade forward. Great, thank you. Uh, do you manage your own properties or do you hire a property management company? It's a combination. 
most of our portfolio now is uh, self-managed through us or through partners. And partners would mean uh, oftentimes we'll bring in, if it's people that have experience in certain regions, we'll either partner with different individuals who have the experience in those regions of managing, or in some cases we have worked with uh, existing property managers, which have been doing a great job. Um, it depends on the property. Great, thank you. Uh, we could probably both answer this one, but I'll let you start. How does this translate to investment in a self-directed IRA? Well, really good point. So uh, all of our investments allow for uh, investments through self-directed IRAs and the effects of it are similar to any other syndication. Most syndications, there's a, a component of debt, which means that instead of direct buying a building all in cash with the IRA and taking all the returns back to your IRA account, um, you're going to lever it up, right? You're going to put some capital in from your IRA and then maybe that'll be the 20% of a down payment and you get 80% from a bank, which is great because now you're gonna get a bunch more profit, right? So, but that hits a UBIT and um, UBIT is a tax that uh, individuals end up getting a, a levied against their IRA account. And, it's, and if you're getting a UBIT tax, it's a really good thing because it means you didn't just buy a billion dollar in cash, you used, leverage from the bank and you're getting a whole lot more back to your IRA account than you should have <laughs> because it wasn't your money that you're getting the profit on. It was the banks. Um, so there is a UBIT tax associated uh, with most investments uh, from IRAs and uh, there will be in, in our funds. However, we do have a blocker, uh, a blocker, which is a, a C corp and it allows for you to invest through that instead, which eliminates the UBIT tax for you. The blocker pays uh, corporate taxes and settles that up, which is a lot less uh, than most of the UBIT taxes. So allows you to invest in a more tax advantaged way and not have to deal with UBIT, specifically in our recessionary acquisitions fund. So we're very sensitive. Most of our investors, even though it's UBIT's a huge win for them, they don't like it. It's kind of complex to deal with. And so we provided a route specifically for our partners like Intrust uh, to be able to do this with. Thank you. And do you have a minimum buy-in? Yeah, we've always had 100,000 minimums from accredited investors. And what metrics for finding recession-proof markets do you use? Well, so there's no such thing as recession-proof. Um, like I say, waterproof watch is always rated to a certain depth, right? And so things will always crack, but you do look, like we said, we look in the past and say in past recessions, what did we see in different markets? Some of the hottest markets right now, like Phoenix, were the absolute worst performing. It took 12 to 14 years for Phoenix to break even after the 2008 recession. So we don't do anything in those kinds of places. We don't do anything in Orlando. We have something in Jacksonville, but Jacksonville, Florida, for example, is more logistics and military education than it is tourism like the rest of Florida. Most of the metrics that we're looking at have to do with the diversified employment. And if you look across the diversified employment, what is it heavy weighted in? And are those traditionally employers or industries which have some recession resilience? Uh, um, education, finance, logistics, infrastructure type, uh, some places that are really high in one type of manufacturing or high tech, um, like San Jose, those tend to be the biggest losers. Um, and we saw some of that. So we're looking at the past data. We're looking at what is the uh, makeup, the diversified makeup, especially healthcare. It's, it's a big one for me. And then we're looking for, are they landlord friendly, meaning in tax advantaged, meaning that are they bringing over, P, uh, are they bringing over businesses? Uh, not only are they bringing over businesses that will bring employment, um, but are they setting up such that it's friendly for us to do business in too, unlike the coastal states or New York and California where you, you can't raise rents and you can't evict and things like that. So we look at a myriad of different factors and um, we have a little bit wider net. We have a little bit more of a luxury with recessionary acquisitions because 
we're not so worried about the long-term growth and you know the long-term turnover. We're more worried about getting in there and trading it forward. It's a little bit more leeway, but still the foundational principles are there. Great, thank you. Um, and I know you touched on this briefly with the AI, but how are you finding your distressed properties and how do you locate investors? Yeah, so I already talked about how we're finding the distressed properties. How do we locate investors? Well, so I started my career in high tech. So I, I had, I had you know, entrepreneurs, business owners, executives uh, from some of the largest medical device, EV, defense uh, companies investing millions of dollars into robotic solutions, automation technology, that custom machine design. And so I came out of this space where I was doing very, very challenging <laughs> technical uh, projects that were much more risky uh, than what I'm doing now. <laughs> and so I had developed a network of, of people in that space. When I, got in, when I got into the business, it was not friends and family. It was just 100,000 accredited investors only and mostly from my high tech background. Um, but since then, as I mentioned, uh, I actually kind of got my head out of the grinding wheel as most engineers just tend to kind of stick, 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 uh, just get the work done kind of. And I, I took some advice from a mentor. I've got a, a best-selling book out, which I'm offering a free copy of. I speak on stages. I'm on podcasts. Now I've been on over 50 podcasts. I've got an article or chapter coming out for a Wall Street Journal book. I've got articles in Forbes. And I actually had my application accepted for TED recently. So I'm actually trying to apply to certain TED talks right now, talk about the uh, fallacy of the American dream and how that's changed. So I think getting out there and talking about my story and becoming, you know, relating and trying to sincerely, my, my wife and I, we're doing just fine now. And we really want to give back and educate. And I think that's helped to draw in a lot of investors uh, that are like-minded and on a similar path. So in short, you're everywhere. I don't, I don't think I'm everywhere. <laughs> there are people everywhere. I'm not a guru. I'm not out selling coaching packages, but you know, I do, uh, I do accept invitations when they come and I appreciate you having me here today. Great. Um, and then last one are, and I can answer this, so we both can answer it. Maybe it comes across to you as well. Are RAAs, Registered Investment Advisors, a source of investor procurement? Or does their self-interest of keeping client cash under their umbrella leave them at loggerheads? Uh, I'll touch on that quick. In our world and in the interest side, we do work with a ton of RAAs um, that truly want to diversify their clients' portfolios. So I wouldn't put them all under the same umbrella. Of course, there are going to be some that want to keep that AUM with their broker-dealer. But a majority and a lot of them do work in the best interest of their client. So for interest, the RAAs are a nice source of client base for us. And then for Patrick, do you work with RAs, family offices, and such? I'm happy to speak with them. As uh, as you mentioned, it's a little bit hit and miss. Um, you know, a lot of the time they're very much looking to keep a, a similar fees uh, that that they get. And um, and I, but I'm happy to speak with any of them that that want to talk. And we have family offices that have invested, private equity that have invested. Um, but we try and keep it fair. We don't write a bunch of side letters so we, we specifically state any side agreements will not affect other lps returns so um, if they're willing to come to the table and play in the same way that other lps do and um, then we're, we're happy to speak with them and we want to make it a win for them because we know that they're just trying to keep food on their family's table too right and uh but I, and i agree there are some really good ones out there that are truly looking for what's best for their clients and those are the kind of ones that we typically resonate with. Great, thank you. So that does wrap up our Q&A at this time. I think we just go on the next slide, we'll do a tough couple more points on the interest side, and then we'll be completing our webinar for today. So our next uh, webinar will be tax-free growth with Roth IRA investments. You can register, register today on the interest website and join us on August 16th. If you have any feedback, please let us know in the survey before you leave the webinar. More information on self-directed IRAs, you can visit our website, www.theintrustgroup.com, and go to our learning center. You can feel free to reach out to myself directly, and please do remember to follow us on social media for all of our updates. And again, any 
Direct questions to Patrick. There were a few that I did answer offline uh, that I asked you to go to Patrick directly. His information is up as well here again. And we do thank everybody for joining. Very insightful today. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Tony. Have a great day, everybody.